Hello everyone, so today I decided to make a video on the John Peabody Harrington notes and the symbols that he uses in his notes. His notes can be really confusing, so let's just go over some of the common symbols that show up. So I just want to first of all clarify that I am not familiar with every single symbol or language that he's documented. Um, there are tons and tons of languages that he's looked at, and I'm mostly familiar with California, so I cannot attest to every single symbol, but if you have any questions, you can, you know, ask me. So, John Peabody Harrington basically wrote down every single sound until he got a good idea of what the sound system of the language was, then he started leaving out some sounds, but, um... A lot of the symbols he uses are the same ones we know in English, so P is P. M is M, H is H, he wouldn't change those, but there are some symbols that are ambiguous. So for example, this one is probably the most famous or the most common symbol you'll see. It's called the glottal stop. It's the uh in the sound uh oh, uh uh uh, that sound. And it has to face to the left. When it faces to the right, it's something else. We'll go over that later, but it has to face the left. So um, you'll probably see this in any language he documents, but it can also come after consonants too, and we'll go over what that becomes. But today, most languages um, just use an apostrophe to make a glottal stop sound. So let's look at this example. It's selenin. So this is the word for the world. Omkuel and omkuel. So we can see here at the beginning of the word before the O, there's the apostrophe that it tells you that, you know, um, the word starts with it, om, so it does start with it, and it also comes after the K, and when um, the apostrophe comes after K, it makes it an adjective, so it will become om kuel, om kuel. so you click the K, and yeah, that's basically, he'll basically use this most of the time for adjectives. Now, when the apostrophe faces the right side, this is what we call aspiration, or like a puff of air after the the um, letter. So it's also, you'll probably see this in any language he documents too, but it's, it usually comes after a consonant. If it comes after um, a vowel, then that just means like there is an H sound after the vowel. But um, today, people usually write it with the superscript H to show aspiration. So when I say aspiration, I mean, like for example, in English, we have bat and pat. When we say pat, there is a puff of air after the P. P, P, P. If you put a piece of tissue in front of your mouth and say pat, you'll see that it flies because you do puff air out. When you say bat, it does not because you do not puff air out. So let's look at this example for Chimarco. So, did you all see him? So, the apostrophe facing to the right comes after the capital K in both words. And that basically means that you puff the air um, for the capital K. Mam kedot komama. If he did not write it there, then it would be mam kedot. And that's wrong. The word is mam kedot. So now let's look at the retroflexed, retroflex T. So when he writes in his notes, it usually comes up as TR or T sha R. So to make this sound, first of all, you have to curl your tongue all the way back. So the tip of the tongue touches, you know, that ridge that comes out the top of your mouth. Tr, tr, tr. It's really noisy, cr, and it's you today and nowadays is usually written as a T with a dot under it, or for Mutsun, um, they use a capital T. So yes, if you look out for T R or T Sha R, they usually mean the same thing. T Sha R just kind of means like the speaker said tr instead of tr. But you know, usually that's just because he's his ear is really precise, so JPH um wanted to make the distinction. So let's look at Chochenyo. As we can see here, there's Hu Drutku, Hu Drutku, Waka Aitakish, or Ketnech. So it means um, hopefully um, the man or the old man. 
the woman or the old man died. So as we can see here in the first word, hu chu tu there's a tr. The tr today will be written as t with the dot underneath it by the muwekuma tribe. Hu chu tu hu chu tu So now let's look at um this ch. The t sha will be pronounced as ch. What we know as ch in English. So. Um, there are a lot of variations of how he writes the sound. Um, usually he writes it with the T sha, like for example in Chochenyo. Sometimes he would write it with a T C, like in Rumsen, or sometimes he would write it with a C and a Charon on top. And nowadays it's usually written as a CH or a C Charon when you look at the modern orthographies. So let's look at what they look like. So um, here. You can see in the first one, Viri Nikun Achai Chakish. This is Karuk. So the girls try to catch him. If we look at the last word, Chakish, we'll see that TC at the beginning is the CH sound, Chakish. And if we look on the right for Rumsen, if we look at Anka Ochoki Kawals, where did I put my knife? You'll see Ochoki, O T T C O K I, Ochoki. Um, the TTC, the double T, kind of just means that um, it's a long CH sound. Ochoki, you hold it. So, you know, as you go through the notes, you'll become more familiar with the language and how he writes it. But this is how he writes the CH a lot of the times. So here is sha, the CH sound in shush. So he also has a lot of variation with how he writes this. Sometimes he writes it with a sha with a C or an S with a Charon or I have only seen this symbol in Mutsun but the underlined S with a superscript Y. So there's a lot of variation of how he writes it. Nowadays it's usually written as a CH or an S Charon. So let's look at each of these examples. So for Mutsun we can see the underlined S. Ekwamehishibinase. Don't do that. So hishe, hishe. There's the underlined s with the y on the top. That basically just means the sh sound. And if we look at Barbarenio or Shmuich, he does write it with an s caron. Kisa shu huchminash. So the s caron just that usually shows up in the older Chumash notes, but um, that kind of just means it's a ch sound oh, sorry sh sound and he uses a c for selenin uh, so the c again same sound sh and last but not least he also writes it with a sha which is the ipa symbol for sh in chimarco so mamot nishekot make a fire nishekot he makes his sha symbols look very loopy so that's how you know that's the sh sound. So here is another common sound in a lot of his notes. It's the x sound or h, the j in Spanish or the ch in Bach. So h h h. He usually writes it with a q. That's his most common symbol. Sometimes he will write it with an x, but that's usually in later years, um, in like the thirties or forties late 30s or 40s, he changes his symbol from the Q to the X. And nowadays, people usually write it with an X. So if we look here, here's another example with um, Chimicum, um, a language spoken in Washington. So the word for uh, two Chim Chimicum person, people is o. So we see that X with the circle under we'll explain what the circle is later but basically it's the h, h, h. the x is the same as the um ipa symbol now if we look at tachi a yokut language he says yachlautni there the q become is like um an x so just keep in mind when he wrote the notes and you know the sound system of the language you're looking at then you'll kind of guess what the q is so now here's like confusing because I was talking about Q before, but here is what um, the IPA symbol is the Q for K. 
So it is a K sound similar to it, but the tongue is touching the spongy part of the throat all the way in the back of your throat. And JPH usually writes it with a capital K. And now it's usually written as a Q in modern orthographies. So this is a previous example. So um, in Chamarco, he wrote mom kedot komama. So if we look here, the capital K looks a lot different as the lowercase k he wrote in the bottom, um, in the bottom right part of the notes. You know that I left in there. Go hut. So that k is in the bottom is a regular k English sound. Same thing as what we have in English or IPA, but the capital K makes it a Q sound. Mam kedot, mam kedot. So that's important to note. And Y, Y, the Y sound, Y and yarn. He usually writes it with a Y. I'm oh, sorry, a J. He usually writes it with a J. That's how it's written in IPA. Sometimes he writes it in the Y, usually it's J. And of course, today, um, to match um, the Roman alphabet, people usually write it with a Y, not a J sound, as he did. So let's look at Selenin. Cho-o-yi. Or sorry, Cho-o-yi. He puts the accent on the I. Cho-o-yi. Dust. In Selenin. So the Y, sorry, the y sound shows up as a J in his writing. Cho-o-yi. Uh, just to keep note, I would say like 75% of the time when he writes a J, it is for the Y sound. So just take it as a Y sound and check the sound system of the language you're looking at to make sure that's right. So cho o yi, cho o yi. And now that we've gone over some of the other symbols like the TR, the two kinds of apostrophes, you can kind of guess um, how the sound will, uh, how this word will sound like based on what we already talked about. Cho o yi. So. Here we're going to look at retroflex S. That's how it's written in the IPA with a little tail. So we flip the tongue upside down. So the tip is kind of touching the palate and you just blow out. It kind of has like a whistling sound to it. This is not a common sound in a lot of um, languages. It shows up in rooms and it shows up in Kitanimuk. But nowadays, it's usually written with an S with a dot under it. So let's look at how it looks like. So here's the first example in Ki Danimuk. Apopi a o shivea. A o shivea. So it kind of sounds like an SH sound, but it has a slight whistling to it. And that's because the sha R means it's a retroflex. A o shivea. And in Rum Sen, we see. Um, I'm watching this. And it's important to know the difference between the retroflex S and the SH sound because Rumsen has both of those. And sh. You have to hear the difference between those. And sh. So there might be some symbols right now that you, know, you don't really know about yet but we will go over diacritics later so i know the line on top of the p in the kitana book example might be confusing but we'll get to it so here is a sound called a lateral fricative this is how it's written ipa you put the tongue in an l position you basically blow out and it'll make that sound and he usually writes it with the slashed l which is what we have in the third line here and this is how modern orthography write it as. So let's look at Dihini, which is um, a Chumash language. So there are a lot of symbols in this language that we haven't gone over yet. But basically we see in the first word, That's what the L slash L looks like. Um, it can look a little similar to a T, but over time you'll be able to distinguish it more easily. And I'm not going to go over this symbol later because this symbol kind of only shows up in Dihini, but the weird, for example, in Wachipu, the first letter in the Chipu 
um it looks kind of weird it's like a a combination of a t and a y and that's because that's basically what it is um a palatalized t the t sound basically in like um the name katiana or tatiana t chip so if you're looking at the lini that's what you're gonna notice so on to look at the vowels so um basically most of the time it's straightforward um a e i o u so a is in father a is in bed or say e e um the i is e o is o u is u so a e i o u first five you can come take that's what it always sound like now some are ambiguous there's an upside down e called the schwa um most of the time it is the barred i u the sound u u and um sometimes occasionally and this is not usually in california this is usually in oregon or washington languages it's like the uh sound like the uh and the uh so just you know just got to ch- double check what the sound system is for the language you're looking at and now we have this little i um i don't really know how to describe it but you know it just doesn't have the dot on like a lowercase i but this usually means that um it's the i and bit i and bit and this usually shows up in oregon or washington languages not california and we have an alpha alpha is kind of like the same thing as the the a and father a uh, a uh. so that also usually shows up in washington and the u uh, kind of looks like a horseshoe is like the u uh in book u uh. and usually today that's written as a u u uh. So let's look at Chemakum, which is a Washington language. Um he writes kwach a kholo which means um one Chemakum person and we also have konnis. Don't remember what that word is for. I'm pretty sure that means blackberry. Konnis, konnis. So yeah, we can see, you know, in kwach um there's that little alpha looking it looks kind of weird a little bit kind of like an x a little bit but if you really pay close attention to it it's actually a vowel and he didn't write an x so it's kwash kwash kind of like the uh sound and you know in a hokolo there's the little it kind of looks like a mangled v but that's not a v that's the horseshoe vowel symbol that we talked about the uh in book a hokolo a ho Kolo. And you know, in Kwanis, we see that little um, I with the two lines on on both sides. Kwanis is. Kwanis. So, last thing to go over is the diacritics. He uses a lot of these. They can be kind of confusing, but these are the most common. What you got to pay attention to is that the line on the top of a sound is um it means it's long and sometimes it's on consonants too like we saw in Keaton Mick earlier um if the line is on top of a, s- a sound that means it's held longer now if we look at the the second item with the little curve on the top of um, a sound that means it's an adjective so he usually writes adjectives as an apostrophe after the consonant but sometimes he does write it with the curve on top and this is usually in like older notes so k uh, so that k would be pronounced as k uh. so a lot of times he also has like a circle underneath um a sound and that just means it's voiceless you don't voice it so when it's underneath an s for example it's like um s basically a regular s but sometimes you know um it might be It might sound like a z if it's between two vowels like aza but he wants to really make sure that you know that it's not a z it's an s s and he makes that by putting the little circle underneath it and you know sometimes he does do this for vowels too so i see this in chumash um after a glottal stop like for example in dilini where for water is do he would say he would put an o with that circle underneath it at the very end of the word to show that after the glottal stop you kind of release a little faint hearing of that vowel but you know it's not supposed to be written it's do do 
do. And that's just because, you know, the mouth is still in the same position at the end of the word. So the last thing to note is a dot after a vowel usually means it's long. So sometimes he writes it with the line on top. Sometimes he writes it with the dot. Don't know why. But if we look at Klamath. So let's look at the first one. An ook. So the P, first thing you notice, it has that curve. That means you pop it. An ook. An ook. I'm exaggerating. I'm sure people don't actually speak like that. All the like, like, an ook. Mm. So we see here, there's that curve. An ook. And in the second line, we see an uget. So he puts that voiceless, um, that voiceless symbol underneath the G, and that just tells you it's not an uget. It's an uget. It's a very. It sounds like a G, but it's actually a very light K. Basically, what he's trying to say is you do not say an uget. It's it does not have a puff of air. It's an uget. It's basically a K. And the last here we see an anat, an anat. The last a has a dot, and that's for long vowel. An anat, an anat. So yeah, that is a lot. The most of the symbols that show up here's a cheat sheet for so you know pauses, take a picture. You will basically. Um, get familiar with the symbols he writes, but if you're struggling and you're not sure, this is basically um, the symbols that he writes. So, good luck.